The Old Testament reading is from Exodus 32, verses 7 through 14, and that's page 78 in your Bibles. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. The epistle is from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17, and that's page 208 in your Bibles. Paul writes to Timothy, I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted in ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus might display his unlimited patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The Gospel reading is from Luke 15, verses 1 through 10. That's on page 78. The parable of the lost sheep. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep, and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. And the parable of the lost coin. For what will 
woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents.
aimed directly at you? Yes? Have, have you ever felt that the minister was up in the pulpit glaring down, looking specifically at you? Yeah, there have been occasions when people have come up to me after worship and said, that sermon was for me, wasn't it? And I, I honestly, in all my years of ministry, have never, ever specifically targeted or aimed a sermon at any one individual until today. <laughs> Nicole. Yes, this sermon's for you. It's also for me. You are a ruling elder in the church, and uh, it's for all the ruling elders here. And it's a sermon for all the ordained deacons. And in fact, since we believe in the priesthood of all believers, well, yes, you all get a taste of the action today as well. But especially you. Because when I read these lessons and realized that we were installing you as student pastor. It just hit me how perfect these three lessons are as they address pastoral ministry, ministry, in three parts. The very first text that was read in the Old Testament is a magnificent passage. I mean, think of it. The people of Israel have been delivered from the land of bondage. Moses is off doing the call that he's called to do. And while he's away with the Lord, the Lord says to him, Hey, these people that I gathered up, oh, am I wrathful? That's church talk for tent. <laughs> God says to Moses, Get down there. I've had it with him. I am furious and angry and ready to judge them and send them, well, you know where. Now this may surprise you. Sometimes there are churches that are stiff-necked. Sometimes there are churches that are the cause of a pastor's wrath. Sometimes, more especially and more importantly, there are churches who follow idols, who break trust and covenant with pastors, break trust and covenant with one another, but more especially, break trust and covenant with their God. Now, if you know the story of Moses, and I know you do, because you've been cramming for your Bible content exam, you know that Moses was really upset with the people of Israel. I mean, he would throw a fit sometimes. I mean, he'd let them have it. He would tell them that they were stiff-necked. He would tell them they were disobedient. I had a church like that once. Those people made me crazy. It was the hardest ministry I've ever had. And I would turn to this passage time and again. And I would think about it and I would learn from it. And here's what I learned that I would share with you. Even though a pastor may be disheartened, maybe feeling that the congregation is entirely stiff-necked and disobedient, even when a pastor feels so broken trust and betrayed by a parish, we learn something important here from Moses. <clears throat> Even though I'm angry and disappointed, what does Moses do? He still understands his responsibility as their leader to talk with God on their behalf. And so Moses claims his authority, even when he is furious, even when he's been betrayed, even when he sees the desperation and, and, and the unrepentant hearts of this people. And he says, can you imagine to God, turn from your
your fears for us. Change your mind. I mean, can you think of that? Having a prayer life that says, yes, God, you're God. Now you change your mind. That's what's happening here. Change your mind. Do not bring disaster on your people. And you know what happened? The Lord changed his mind. Wow. What profound courage of leadership and spiritual integrity this Moses had. As we pursue ministry, you too, as we pursue ministry, we have to have that kind of a, of a prayer life. A prayer life that commits to being a spiritual chiropractor to stiff-necked people. <laughs> a prayer life that reminds God of God's steadfast faithfulness even when we just are terrible. And the ability to remind God that all that constitutes faith and religion exists to the glory of God. Essentially what Moses argues here is, Lord God, glorify your name even with such despicable, stiff-necked people as these. I have some good news for you. The good news is that I can honestly say that I do not experience this congregation as stiff-necked. Amen. <laughs> and that's the very good news. But someday in your ministry, you may run into a stiff-necked people. And elders and deacons and congregants and priesthood of all believers, someday you may run into a stiff-necked person within the body of Christ, someone that makes you crazy. And still, because you are who you are, you don't abandon them. You pray for them. You don't have two prayer lists, one for good things, and if you're on the other prayer list, as the chaplain recently told me, she has two prayer lists. If you're on that prayer list, oh, you don't want to be on that prayer list. <laughs> no, that's not it. Moses teaches us better. And of course, your favorite book, Timothy. Timothy, in this one section, is to be embraced. It's to be embraced because Paul keeps a keen humility in his ministry. He constantly declares that I received mercy and the grace of our Lord overflowed with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus and are displayed with utmost patience. We clergy are crack pots. Go to enough presbytery meetings, you'll figure it out quickly. But there's a humility that reminds us that despite our frailty and our fracture, and despite our humanity, God's Holy Spirit seems to do remarkable and wonderful things. That's the second part of ministry. Doing your best, but really always trusting in God. And then there's the Gospel. I'm not talking about the woman that went looking for the but this is said, it said that all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Follow Jesus. Welcome sinners. Eat with them. Be willing to go outside of the box. Be willing to go the extra mile. Be willing to go and dig deep to find that precious child of God who's lost in the world. Be willing to 
They are children of God. 